partners around the world understand that this fight is not only a fight for the future of Ukraine, it's about sovereignty, security, and freedom itself. Republicans around the country were sick and tired of losing, including myself. I didn't run to preserve the status quo. I ran to get things done. Hello, everyone. I'm Major Garrett in Washington. Welcome, welcome to America Decides. President Biden is heading back from Europe after meeting with the leaders of Nordic nations in Helsinki today. The visit caps off a multi-day trip to the continent, and the president is celebrating several significant goals achieved at the NATO summit in Lithuania, including... Turkey's decision to back Sweden's bid to join the alliance, that's a big reversal, as well as new security commitments for Ukraine and its ongoing battle with Russia. Now, during remarks today, Biden said NATO is, quote, more united than ever. CBS News' senior White House correspondent Weijia Jiang joins us now. Weijia, give us an overview of the week that was and how the White House feels about it. Well, this certainly is a time to celebrate a victory, as you just mentioned, Major, for the White House, the president saying that they accomplished everything they set out to do. And his closing message that NATO is stronger than ever is not necessarily new. It was, in fact, his opening message. But he could say it with much more confidence after a week of robust meetings with uh, NATO members and making sure that the path is cleared for Sweden to enter as the 32nd a member, which has yet to happen, but is on its way. And also, as you mentioned, to present new security assurances to Ukraine, as he spent much of his time here trying to bolster and rally support for that country as the war drags on there. But, Major, it is interesting today that when asked whether this war could continue to drag on, he did say he believed that Putin has already lost, because in his opinion, he does not believe Russia can win the war. Uh, he also um, said that even though Ukraine is not technically in NATO, that, of course, uh, this alliance will continue to offer the support needed uh, for this to draw down. Major. And, Weijia, there was also an announcement today from the U.S. Secret Service about cocaine that was found inside the White House complex, the West Wing specifically. What did the Secret Service say? Well, not exactly what the president wanted, according to his own press secretary, who, when this happened 10 days ago when the cocaine was found inside the West Wing of the White House, she insisted that it was very important to President Biden to find out who brought it in. And we now know that the Secret Service investigation is going to end without answering who brought it in, without any person of interest um, or determination of how it got inside. We have not heard from President Biden himself about this, not even since uh, the cocaine was found. But there are mounting questions now that they are unable to identify who it was, um, including whether the president is going to ask the Secret Service to revise its security protocols uh, since an illegal substance did make its way into the West Wing. So it's not exactly what the president had hoped out of this investigation, but certainly Republicans are attacking ferociously, um, asking those questions about the security and whether there was a failure at the White House. We just thank you. We should know the Secret Service said no DNA, no fingerprints, and no video. Lots of questions remain. Last fall, the GOP's goal of taking back the majority in the Senate failed, and failed conspicuously. The National Republican Senatorial Committee, now led by Montana Senator Steve Daines, appears to be taking a different approach for 2024. Politico reports that, quote, senior Republicans are mounting their most aggressive Senate primary intervention strategy in nearly a decade, sidelining candidates they suspect could blow their chances to claim the majority next fall. I asked Senator Daines if, in fact, this is the plan. What I found is that uh, Republicans around the country were sick and tired of losing, including myself, looking at what happened certainly in 2022. Um, and we need to have candidates that can win not just primary elections, but also general elections. I think we've demonstrated in the past is candidates could win a primary, but at the end of the day, uh, elections in politics is about addition, not subtraction and division. And finding candidates that can appeal to a you know, broader spectrum of the Republican voters, as well as appeal to independent voters, will be key to uh, success in 24. And that's why we're uh, being a lot more thoughtful and deliberate about finding candidates that can, uh, can have a broader appeal. What happened to let the voters decide? 
Well, they always will at the end of the day. The voters will decide on that. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure we've got candidates. And in some races, like we've got Ohio as an example, um, we've got candidates there that uh, uh, all three of those candidates, um, I, we assume Frank LaRose, the Secretary of State, probably gets in that race. I think it's a safe assumption. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, and so when you have three candidates that any one of them could win the general election, uh, you know, we don't, we don't uh, stay up late at night worrying about that. But if we have a situation where a candidate may not be able to appeal across a broader spectrum, that's where we'll be more intentional to try to get candidates that can. So if I just want to translate that, you'll stay out of Ohio? Yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will you stay out of Michigan? Um, well, Michigan is still developing right, right. now. Um, so there is not a declared candidate at the moment. Uh, we'll wait and see. John Tuttle, Mike Rogers? John Tuttle's looking at it. Mike Rogers is looking at it there. Do you have a favorite uh, we'll there? See. No, we don't. We'll wait and see, kind of see how that unfolds. It's still early. Uh, neither of them have yet declared. Uh, so more to come on that. We'll, we'll let them break that news. Mm -hmm. Analyze Arizona for me. Yeah, well, first of all, um, it's, it's a very competitive state. Just look at the macro level. I mean, it wasn't long ago where uh, Doug Ducey, Republican governor, in fact, Doug Ducey and I worked at Procter & Gamble together, and he went off to, uh, to make ice cream, and I went off to make software after we left P&G. Uh, it wasn't long ago we had a Republican governor in Arizona. We had two Republican senators, John McCain and Jeff Flake. So it's, it's a state that has a Republican heritage, uh, I think with candidates... But trending away. It has in the last, the last uh, couple of elections. However, um, I think that will come down to a candidate that can appeal to both, uh, you know, across the Republican spectrum and independent voters. You look at the story of 2022, I think it was a story of independent voters mm -hmm. uh, went to the Democrat side by a, a slight margin. A decisive in, margin. In a, well, um, it was about D plus two, as we saw. Mm -hmm. But typically, in a midterm election, with the party in power, the White House, the other party picks up seats. The other party should see, you know, a, a significant gain among independent voters. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case in 22. You know, the red wave showed up in 22. What happens, independent voters uh, did not come to the Republican side enough to, of course, win back the Senate majority and have, a, I think, frankly, a very slim majority in the U.S. House. What does Carrie Lake's performance as a gubernatorial candidate in that midterm election tell you about her prospects next cycle? Yeah, you know, I think, um, first of all, it's probably going to be a three-way race mm -hmm. um, with uh, Senator we'll get Sinema, to that in a second. Senator Sinema being an independent in that race. Um, it, it creates a very interesting dynamic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Congressman Gallego is very liberal. Uh, I think he's going to be out of touch with uh, where independent voters are in, uh, in Arizona and even some Democrats. Uh, certainly Republicans aren't going to be, uh, have any appeal with, with Gallego. Uh, but I think t to win Arizona as Republican, it's a very winnable race. It's, you want to make sure you're focused on the future. They don't want to hear about grievances of the past. They want to know what are you going to do to address the problems of this country and looking forward. So Carrie Lake's not someone you would see yourself and the committee supporting? Well, we've, we've had conversations with Carrie. Long conversations. She, she, she was a, here. Uh, she sat down with you for several, did. Yeah, yeah. almost we, two we, hours, we had, we, had, we had a very good discussion about, uh, you know, what, what's it mean to win in Arizona? And talking about the future, uh, casting... Was she receptive? To, she was. It, it, was a, it was a very robust, it was a good discussion. So you're but leaving open the possibility? Yeah. We, I mean, it's, ultimately... Ultimately, we'll see what happens. Again, we don't have. We've got uh, Sheriff Mark Lamb in that race mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in uh, Arizona. I mean, he's a good guy. Uh, you find that sheriffs uh, can become uh, statewide elected officials. We saw that happen with uh, Sheriff Lombardo in Nevada, mm -hmm. who is now Governor Lombardo. Yep. Uh, and when you think about a border state like Arizona, um, a sheriff kind of bio with uh, the out-of-control situation on the southern border is, is, is a pretty good appeal to voters. What does the cinema factor mean in that race? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, in polling that we've done and looked at, find that it's going to be difficult for an independent candidate uh, to, to win uh, a general election. And that's been the case, you know, in politics for a long time. We are still, at the end of the day, you know, a two-party system, albeit there's increasingly more independence, but we are still a two-party system. So I think it's going to be difficult uh, for Senator Sinema in, if she stays in that independent language. I think, you know, she's officially declared if she gets in the race, which she has not yet declared, so it's, there's a what if there, but if she gets in, I think it'll be difficult for her to win the general election. So, do you have a game plan in case she doesn't, and it becomes a one-two yeah. instead of a three? Right, well, again, um, at the end of the day... And how does that influence your decision about Carrie Lake? Yeah, these elections are always about a choice, and uh, uh, you look at where how far left uh, 
Congressman Gallego has has uh, has driven. Um, I think that's going to be. Uh, he's he's not going to have an appeal to independent voters, and certainly uh, we call our soft Republicans. So it remains to be seen what happens there in Arizona on the Republican side. I know Carrie Lake's looking at it, uh, and uh, you know she she's very smart. She's very articulate. If, if she focuses on the future of this country and the problems we face in this nation and less about what's happened in the past, uh, I think that will be a competitive race. Next, whether or not former President Trump will stay out of Senate primaries this time around, I'll ask the chairman. You are streaming America Decides. I want your assessment of where the Republican Party is on this question of elections and denialism. I think it's a disaster. Uh, I mean, this is the worst performance for the Republican Party. Uh, it's it, it, We perform worse than we did after Watergate. Fashionable sunglasses. That was part of my conversation last month with former Maryland Republican Governor Larry Hogan. I also asked Senator Steve Daines if he agrees that election denialism is quite simply a terrible strategy for Republicans heading into 2024. Here's what he had to say. Well, I think voters have weighed in and decided that uh, if that becomes the primary message for a candidate, uh, they, they'll look somewhere else. At the end of the Is day, that a litmus test it, for this committee? It, at the end of the day, they want to talk about what you're going to do to solve their problems, not the grievances of the candidate's problems. And so I think casting a vision forward, what we're going to do for this country looking forward here, is you know, where more voters are than not as we look at 2024. So it would be fair to say that it is a litmus test for the committee. Well, I'm, litmus test is one thing. I, I don't know if you use a litmus test, but it is a concern if the primary message of a candidate is looking backwards and not looking forwards here. I just think it comes down to electability and winning. We're about winning. Uh, and I think we've, we've proven back in 2022 that uh, looking backwards is not a winning strategy. Politico also said that uh, in 2022, Trump assembled a roster of unsuccessful candidates. You agree? Well, you look at the results that happened in 22. Um, these, we had candidates that uh, that could win primaries, but could not with the win Trump endorsement. General elections. There was another factor, though, also in in 22, and that is we had candidates that were massively outspent. In terms of the gap of of uh, you know, Democrat campaign dollars versus Republican campaign dollars in Senate races. It was the all-time greatest gap of Democrats having that advantage in our nation's history. And so in, in some of these races, uh, the, the difference uh, in campaign dollars, the advantage that Democrats had, it was very difficult to get a message out when you were outspent. Yes, but you know you had the atmospheric winds at your back and still didn't pull it across. Well, you, you have the atmospheric winds, but we also were massively outspent. But it also, candidate quality matters. Mm -hmm. It does. I mean, this gets back to uh, one of our primary strategies here at the NRSC is finding candidates, recruiting candidates, encouraging candidates that not only can win primary elections, but can win general elections. Again, it's, it's, there's a, it, it's about addition and it's about independent voters. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we'll decide these elections. So help me resolve this tension. You've endorsed former President Trump. Uh, he likes to weigh in on these things. He assembled this roster of unsuccessful candidates in 2022. How do you resolve that tension, that ongoing tension between him at the top of the Republican Party right now, possibly the nominee, wanting to get involved and recruit better candidates so you can be more successful? Look, you know, I, I was a business guy before I came uh, uh, here to, uh, to Capitol Hill. And um, while President Trump was in office, uh, we accomplished some great things in terms of tax cuts, uh, great, you know, the Abraham Accords on foreign policy. You saw the greatest conservation win in 50 years, the Great America Outdoors Act. Very proud of that as a, as a Westerner who strongly believes in defending and supporting our public lands. It was President Trump that got that done, signed it into law. We're closely with him. Look what we did in the courts, in the Supreme Court. You know, significant changes there in the Supreme Court. Um, so I've always had a constructive relationship with President Trump and continue to do so to this day. Uh, we talk frequently and he wants to win. Of course, he wants to win the presidency but he also wants to make sure that the Senate, the Senate also has senators that he can work with. Think about the first call. So, that, are, you, so are you working more collaboratively? Is that what you're trying yes, to tell me? Yeah. That yeah. he'll stay out of places that he might have gotten into earlier? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, we have a chance to have very good conversations back and forth and talk about how we're going to win these races in these key states. Because the, the, the first phone call, if he's elected president, will be to the Senate 
because he's got to get his nominations to you. Think about the Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense. We may have two Supreme Court vacancies coming up uh, in, uh, in, the, in the course of the, of the next administration. And so he's got to have a Republican majority mm -hmm. in the Senate mm -hmm. to move through his presidential nominees. No. Tell me how you can beat Tester. He's formidable. He has a connection to that state that has proven itself yeah. resilient. Yeah. Is he more at his most vulnerable now or what? Yeah. Well, I look back first at 2020, the change we've seen in Montana when I ran against uh, Steve Bullock, Bullock, very popular Democrat governor. Mm -hmm. His net favorables were plus 30 when he entered the race against us in March of 2020. It was a $210 million Senate race, the most expensive race on a per vote basis in the history of America. We were outspent by $50 million. One by 10. We beat him 55-45. Another big gathering of Republican candidates kicks off tomorrow in, you guessed it, Iowa. Why who won't be there is making headlines in more ways than one. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. A fair number of 2024 Republican candidates, but notably not former President Trump, are getting ready to attend Friday's Family Leadership Summit in Des Moines. The Christian conservative organization's signature event is seen as influential for evangelical voters in the state. Iowa's caucuses, of course, lead off the GOP's 2024 calendar on January 15th. And according to the latest data I've seen, evangelical voters could make upwards of 60 percent of the turnout on that caucus evening. Joining us now is Amanda Rooker, chief political reporter for KCCI, a CBS affiliate in Iowa. Man, always great to see you. You'll be on hand tomorrow. What's the importance of this event, and how much does it matter that Trump won't be there? Well, Major, great to be here. And as you mentioned, evangelicals are such an important group of Iowans within the Republican Party here. And many of them are going to be here tomorrow at that Iowa Family Leadership Summit. Now, this is a group of voters that candidates have been courting. They've been meeting with faith leaders. They've been hosting campaign kickoffs at churches, uh, Donald Trump being one of them. He, the last time he was in Iowa, met with faith leaders, but he will not be here tomorrow to try to court that group. Now, six of his competitors will be, and they'll be able to make a pitch to Iowa Republicans that they are the candidates that represent evangelical interests, while Trump will not be able to make that pitch. So Iowa's Republican Governor Kim Reynolds has been the target of some backlash from the former president because he says the governor is tacitly supporting Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, even though the governor has said, as previous governors have ahead of the Iowa caucuses, that they're going to remain neutral. Is this having any effect there? on the ground, among the conversation, among likely caucus voters? Well, it's hard to say what the impact of those comments will be, but I can tell you it's certainly something that's being talked about among Iowa Republicans. And the major thing that I'm hearing is that these comments were really jarring to a lot of Iowa Republicans. They love Governor Kim Reynolds. She is incredibly popular among Iowa Republicans. Her approval rating near 90 percent among Iowa Republicans, and she cruised to victory and re-election in 2022, won by nearly 20 points there. So Iowa Republicans love her, and hearing Donald Trump criticize Reynolds was very confusing to some, uh, frustrating to others. One top Iowa Republican I just spoke to was at the State House uh, this week for a special legislative session. He told me that there was a lot of conversation of people saying, you know, this makes Trump look like a wild card or more unhinged or someone who's willing to attack someone that is very popular in Iowa. And does that mean that he'll put Iowans' interests first? Although it's unlikely that this these comments would really shake uh, hardcore support from that fiery, white-hot Trump base. But what Iowa Republicans are telling me it may do is it leaves the door open for Iowans that are maybe on the fence about Trump to really look at some of the other candidates. And again, uh, just tomorrow, we're going to have six other candidates here that Iowans can talk to and meet. Trump will not be here to defend his case. So this week, the governor is going to sign a six-week abortion ban. What effect do you think that will have on the event tomorrow and the ongoing conversation about how specific Republicans seeking support in Iowa will need to be on that issue? Well, major abortion has already been such a central issue in the 2024 race for the Republican nomination. Uh, and it's going to be central at the Family Leadership Summit tomorrow. Governor Reynolds is going to sign a fetal heartbeat bill, a six-week abortion ban uh, at that summit. And 
this is going to be a chance for candidates to really make clear their position on abortion. Uh, Trump, who's kind of waffled on abortion policy in the past, again, won't be able to do that here tomorrow. KCCI's Amanda Rooker, thanks so very much. That does it for today. You can stream America Decides Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Here's something you already knew, but a friendly reminder, you're streaming CBS News.